Hi, I'm Mark Priestley. After a life spent in the elite environment of the Formula One pit lane learning how to win, this podcast aims to bring that elusive, high-performance culture into your daily lives. In this week's episode, I'm looking at how the sport of Formula One has turned situations that often posed enormous threat into massive opportunity, plus how one of the biggest defeats of my entire career was turned into one of our biggest successes. Welcome back to Pit Lane Life Lessons. Talk about how Formula One teams are so successful. Tiny things, but you only find those tiny things when you look for them. Of course, there's only one winner in every Grand Prix, so for everybody else, you haven't won, so it could be deemed that's, that's a failure. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pit Lane Life Lessons podcast. Thank you so much, as ever, for joining and listening wherever it is you are in the world, however it is you're listening, whatever it is you're up to whilst you're listening. I appreciate every single one of you. And I want to do a special mention, a special shout out for you guys this week, because this podcast is still relatively in its infancy. It's growing, and I'm really pleased to say that it's growing. But I want you guys to be proud of the fact that you were here at the beginning. This is going to be a community that we build here together, and you guys are the founding members of it. And I want you to take some pride in that. So thank you. It's only continuing to this day because of you, because you keep coming back. It will only continue in the future because of what you do, how you interact with it, how you share it, how you help it to grow. I love the fact that you're doing those things. Sending me messages really keeps me going, but sending other people messages, telling them to listen to the podcast, sharing it on your socials, and of course, those all important reviews in the podcast store make a huge, huge difference. So thank you very much to all of you. I really do mean that. Um, Now, this week, I've got two topics that I want to cover that both came out of an event that I was speaking at recently. I was at Silverstone talking to a company, an enormous company, by the way, a company that has 350,000 employees around the world. Yeah, you heard that right. 350,000 people work for this organization. Massive company. Now, obviously, I wasn't speaking to all of them, but this smaller group of around 1,000 people that I had in front of me at Silverstone for this particular event, when I'd finished speaking, came back with two interlinked but still different questions. And I think questions that have huge value in the question and hopefully value in the way that I answered those questions. So I thought I'd bring that to you this week. As many of you know, this podcast is born out of the fact that I spend my life talking to corporate clients about how they can think more like a Formula One team, how they can operate more like an elite Formula One team. And the podcast is to share those messages with you. I want you, you and I, to be able to think more like a Formula One team. It offers value. It offers the chance to grow and to have bigger and better success. I know that from my experience. I've been privileged enough to grow up in this world of Formula One with a unique experience of being right in the heart of a Formula One team, going through some amazing moments, working with some amazing people. But it's the F1 mindset, as I said in a previous episode just recently, it's the F1 mindset, the F1 way of thinking that I see as the biggest thing that I've been able to take from that time in the sport. And it's that that I'm trying to pass on to you. So I spent this session with this team talking about change. The subject of the conference, the subject of the meeting of the event was dealing with change. Everybody's going through massive change right now, every company, but also every individual. We've had a couple of years just gone by that have provoked massive change in almost every single area. And as I always say with change, it's the people that deal with change best that come out of the other side looking stronger with more opportunity ahead of them. It's those who struggle to deal with change or those who resist change that really find it hard to emerge out of a period of change with any hope, with any new prospects, with any opportunity for growth. And so that's the sort of thing that I was talking to this company about. And as part of the story that I told, I told my version of what happened when Formula One went through a massive change uh, when tobacco advertising was banned. Now, I may have mentioned this in a previous episode in, in some respect, but the idea that that was a huge threat, as many people saw it, to the existence of Formula One. And that's not an exaggeration. Formula One was almost entirely bankrolled for many years 
through the sponsorship that came from the tobacco advertising uh, business model. And it was a huge amount of money. It was relatively easy money as well, because the Formula One teams didn't really have to work very hard for it. And it was a stream of money that everybody became utterly reliant upon for quite a long period of time. Now, the period of change, of course, was when that business model was becoming outlawed, when advertising of tobacco products was being banned. And that posed a threat because all of a sudden the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that flowed freely into Formula One teams every single year without too much necessity to go out and earn that money, to work hard for that money. Essentially, that money was coming in in exchange for a big sticker that went on the side of the car that was then paraded around the world to hundreds of millions of people. It was for exposure. Now, we didn't have to work too hard for exposure. It was the very nature of what we do as a Formula One team. So it was good times for the Formula One teams. Loads of money coming in, not too much need to work hard or to innovate or to try particularly hard to give too much in the way of customer value back. The money came in, the sticker went on the side of the car, and that was kind of the business model. Obviously, it was way more complex than that. It was more nuanced than that. But that was the basics of the way that Formula One teams operated. And so when that model was being banned, when tobacco advertising was being banned, a lot of people panicked. A lot of people saw it as a massive threat to the Formula One teams, even to the industry. And I genuinely remember reading reports in the motorsport press, and this wasn't long after I'd just got my dream job in Formula One. I remember reading these reports about how significant this threat was, how it could spell the end for some teams, and even people speculated it could spell the end of Formula One. That's how significant a threat it was being seen as at the time. And the story that I went on to tell uh, during this session at Silverstone in front of these people was how Formula One dealt with that, and particularly how my Formula One team, McLaren, dealt with that way better than many others. And the reason that we dealt with it better than many others was because we didn't necessarily see it as a threat. We saw it as an opportunity. And it came from Ron Dennis. It was Ron who said, look, we can join this group of people, this group of stakeholders in the sport who are actually putting quite a lot of time and effort and resource money into fighting back against this ruling desperately trying to cling on to the existing ways of doing things, trying to hang on to this comfortable, luxurious existence that we enjoyed at the time. But what Ron said was, we could do that, or we could see this not as a threat, but as an opportunity. And the way that Ron described this was he said that everybody in Formula One, including us, by the way, has become complacent with this easy stream of money flowing into our businesses. We'd become lazy in the way that we operated because we hadn't been pushed. We hadn't been forced to go and think outside the box and work hard for the investment, for the partners that we needed to fund our racing. We'd become lazy. We'd fallen into this same lazy trap that everyone else had. And he said that presents an enormous opportunity because if the competition are all sleeping, if the competition are comfortable if the competition have no desire to become uncomfortable and to push themselves, that presents an opportunity for us. The world may be changing around us. It's not a change that was driven by us. It was a, tra a change that's been thrust upon us. We had no choice that this change was coming. And he said, even if these people, these stakeholders of Formula One, the other teams who are fighting back against this ruling to ban tobacco advertising, even if those people have some success, and that's a big if, it's going to be a temporary success. They may get some temporary extension to the ruling. Maybe they can advertise tobacco products for another three years, perhaps. What they won't be able to do is to advertise tobacco products forever. And he said what they're doing is they're opening up a glaring opportunity for somebody who wants to go down a different path. And that was exactly what we tried to do at McLaren. We tried to deal with that change, seeing it as an opportunity, not a threat. And that meant we had to reanalyze every single thing that we did. We had to use the strengths that we had in our business, the attention to detail that McLaren was famed for over and above every other team to analyze what we did, to question what we did, to think of new ways of working, to go out and entice 
new partners, new investors, new sponsors into our business with a new invigorated approach, with an innovative approach, an approach that we hadn't had to have for many years because we hadn't had to work for it. And many of these specific details of what we did differently, how we changed things, I've labelled out, I've set out in other podcasts, I've set them all out in my book. So you can go and read all about these stories in more depth if you want to get my book, The Mechanic. But I think the point here is that seeing the threat as an opportunity, or seeing the change rather, as an opportunity and not a threat, was the biggest message I was trying to impart on these people at Silverstone. Because we're all going through change, as I said, everybody is facing change. And so it's the same situation. It's an environmental change. It's the change that's happening to the environment around us. The world is changing through no fault of our own, through no decision making of our own. The world has just gone through a global pandemic, is still going through a pandemic in many regards. That changes everything. We've had to change the way we work. We've had to change where we live, how we live, all manner of things. The economy is changing rapidly off the back of this global pandemic. We are facing what could be seen as threats in almost every area. But we're also looking at potential opportunities in almost every area, too, because if we see this changing landscape as a blank canvas to do things in a different way, not just to evolve from our existing ways of doing it, tweaking tiny things to change a small amount like we do naturally over years, but almost go back to the drawing board and see a fresh landscape ahead of us as a fresh canvas to paint a new picture on. That's where the opportunity lies. And so I was talking to these people about all of the opportunities that may be presented to them if they can think differently about the future, if they can think differently about the changing environment that they're facing. And the discussion went on and my talk went on for about an hour. We talked about these things. And then at the end of that talk came the inevitable questions. And as I said before, I love the questions. I love the part where the audience gets to actually engage with me, to ask me questions, to probe me even further than I may have gone in terms of what I've spoken about, which is specific to their business. They can come back at me with responses to that. They can ask me to go deeper in certain areas that might be relevant to them. Sometimes it's specifically about Formula One. It can be about anything, but I really enjoy that part. And on this particular occasion, there were a couple of really great questions. The first of which was this. Somebody, when the microphone came to them, said... Okay, so you've spoken about this threat slash opportunity that Formula One faced with the banning of tobacco advertising a few years ago. And the question was, what's the next big threat slash opportunity that Formula One faces and how do we think they'll deal with it? And I really loved that question. My eyes lit up. I got really into it because it's a passion of mine. That's exactly what Formula One has taught me over the years, to look at all of the things that happen every single day, every single year, long term and short term, and find the opportunities in them. It's a Formula One way of thinking. It's my mindset, having spent so many years in the sport, and it's exactly what I'm trying to share with you now. And so my answer to this question was, well, the next big threat, existential threat I'm talking about, a threat that could pose a real challenge to the very existence of our sport. Now, you might think, well, what on earth could possibly be that big that it could threaten Formula One? And my answer to that question was, well, it's the environmental challenge that we face. Because if you think about sustainability and climate change and the environment, and then you think about Formula One, they go almost diametrically opposed, clashing against each other. They're up against each other. They don't go in almost any way hand in hand. We are racing, noisy, gas-guzzling cars for fun that are churning emissions out the back of those cars. We are flying those cars and hundreds of tons of freight all around the world, thousands of people all around the world in the most inefficient way. It's an exuberant sport. It's a luxurious sport. It's never been a sport that could ever have been associated with being environmentally friendly. And as the world changes, and that becomes even more and more important to people, to a point where being unenvironmentally friendly becomes so socially unacceptable that we just can't do it anymore, that it's simply not an option for anybody. 
that could pose a threat to the very existence of the sport that we love. If you think about smoking, if you think about the way that smoking and the opinions of smoking and the thinking around smoking has changed over the last few years because of massive governmental campaigns, social campaigns, because of the changing generational thinking that we now have, younger children in the most part, by far in the most part, have absolutely no desire to start smoking. In fact, way more than that, it's become socially unacceptable in many parts of the world. If something becomes socially unacceptable, it then becomes frowned upon. It then becomes something that people turn away from. Now imagine if that were to happen to Formula One. Imagine if burning gas-guzzling fuels for no other reason other than for fun and entertainment becomes so socially unacceptable that the next generations of our sport just start turning off, just start walking away. They have no interest. In fact, they could actually have a vested interest in campaigning against it, in getting it shut down. That poses a threat to our sport. Now you might think, well, that's a bit dramatic. It's a bit over the top. I don't think it is. Formula One needs to take this potential threat seriously. But what it really needs to do and what it is doing is not seeing it as just a threat. It's seeing it as an opportunity. And this whole changing landscape, this newfound responsibility that we should have had many years ago, and that is a failing on everybody's part, but now it's becoming front page news. It's becoming much higher up the priority, higher up the agenda. People have to start talking about it. Every single business and company of any standing and of any worth, of any value, has to have a sustainability policy, an environmental responsibility. And it's exactly the same for Formula One. And so how does Formula One look at the future and turn what could be a threat? And let's make no mistake, it can still be a threat. If you get it wrong, it could wipe you out. The world is littered with examples. I may have even mentioned them in some previous episodes of this podcast. The idea of blockbuster failing miserably when streaming came online and Netflix taking advantage of that, seeing the opportunity that Blockbuster missed. Blockbuster has all but disappeared. Netflix now dominates an industry. There are many examples of this in all different types of industry and all different areas of society. When change comes along, you can see it two ways. You can see it as something that's going to disrupt and interrupt your comfortable way of living, the way that you operate right now that you kind of quite like, that you've become used to, that you don't really want to change. Or you see it as the opportunity that is almost always there. You look for that opportunity. You dig deep. You pull it apart and you try and understand, although even it may look like a threat. It might look quite serious and grave on the outside. Somewhere in there will be the chance to do something different that offers up opportunity for you. And that is where Formula One, I believe, sits right now. This whole idea of embracing environmentalism, of making Formula One part of the solution, not part of the problem to the environmental impact that we currently have on the world and on the climate. And we're doing that in a number of ways. You'll have heard already about their push towards carbon net zero events by 2030. And that's a serious push. That's not just some token gesture. That's not virtue signaling. That is a genuine push to do things properly. Not just ticking a box, but they are completely reevaluating the way that a Formula One event takes place, how it takes place, where it takes place, when it takes place, how we get there. All of those things are being looked into very seriously. But when it comes to Grand Prix racing itself, I mean, it's an industry centred around technology, famed for its technological innovation. So many great innovations in the automotive sector and beyond have come from the hotbed of engineering brilliance that is the Formula One pit lane. And if we apply that brilliance, that technical mindset that we have, that can-do attitude that Formula One exists upon, if we apply that to a changing world, to an opportunity that we might see ahead of us, well, we could come out of the other side, not only in a really strong position, but we could come out of the other side being seen as a leader for change, being seen as one of the driving forces behind technological advancement towards a sustainable future in the automotive sector. 
And that is the way that Formula One are looking at this potential problem on the horizon. They're looking at how technology could help us to overcome the challenges that we face. The challenge of rising carbon in the atmosphere, the challenge of depleting fossil fuels to power these cars. And whilst the world is moving in a direction of electric vehicles, putting a huge amount of time and energy and resource into developing that technology, Formula One has recognised, along with many other people, that it's not the total solution. It could be that Formula One could go electric. That's one potential outcome here. But first of all, someone's already done it. There's Formula E. And secondly, it's not a good technological solution for Formula One. In the same way, it's not necessarily a good technological solution for everybody out in the wider world. And so Formula One has decided to look at this problem differently. They've decided to invest in an area that many people are not investing in to anywhere near the same extent. This idea of sustainable fuels as a power source for our cars. Now, if Formula One were able to accelerate the development of that technology rapidly, which is what Formula One does best, and develop a synthetic fuel that could be sustainably produced and really genuinely sustainably produced, which is what they're looking at, we could end up not only minimising the wider impact on the world, because if this fed down into the automotive sector, we don't need to scrap every car on the road today and replace it with an expensive new electric one. We could repurpose our existing vehicles to simply run on a better fuel that Formula One has developed. And so that's the major focus that's going on in the background right now. Many of you, I'm sure, will have already heard many of the details, but it's coming. It will happen. And I happen to know, because I've spoken to many people involved in this project, that it's being done properly. I have a major belief that this could end up being a seminal moment for Formula One, a moment that in many years to come, we look back on and we talk about and we reflect on as being the moment, it's our blockbuster moment, our Netflix moment, where we had massive threat on the horizon to the existence of our industry and yet we didn't see it that way. We took the opportunity that that presented. We carved out an opportunity. Nobody thrust that opportunity in front of us. We had to look at it, look for it. We had to delve deep to find what it was And I believe we will look back on this and say we found that opportunity and we developed a technology that not only saved, maybe rescued Formula One, but also set it up for a brilliant future that has longevity, that has sustainability ahead of it. But even bigger than that, way bigger than that, this could be the moment when Formula One develops a technology that can benefit almost everybody on this planet. What an incredible legacy that could be for our sport. What a brilliant thing to have associated with the industry that you and I all love, that's so often been associated with a negative environmental impact, that's been criticised, rightly so, for many years for being self-indulgent, wasteful, over-exuberant. All of these things that are criticisms that are difficult to argue against. But what if that was the old Formula One? And what if things are changing? What if the new Formula One is the opposite of those things? What if this fork in the road that Formula One is currently at, where one path could potentially lead to a slow and painful demise, possibly even death, But the other fork, the fork that Formula One has chosen to take because it's seeing opportunity rather than the threat as the right way to go, what if going down that fork in the road, down that path, leads us to a place where Formula One becomes celebrated, not just inside the sport, but outside it, on a much wider scale, by people who are not even Formula One fans, but now recognise that this industry has developed technology that's helped the world, that's helped the planet. Now, people will throw back the argument that Making this change, going down this path for Formula One, it's not going to save the world. It's not the saviour for everything. And of course it isn't. There is no single thing that's going to save the world. However, this could be a big step in the right direction. This could be a small change that leads on to another change, that leads to another change, that eventually becomes an even bigger and much more significant change. That's how life and development works. 
But imagine if Formula One can develop a fuel source, not only to power its cars, but to power everything. The planes that move the people and the freight around the world, the generators that power the paddocks, the manufacturing facilities that create the cars, but also so many of the supplies in Formula One, and even expand it further than that. Imagine if a technology like this that minimises the need to keep pulling finite resources out of our ground, out of the earth, and minimising the emissions, the harmful emissions that are created as a result of burning these sustainable fuels. Imagine that on a grand global scale and the size of the impact that it could end up having. So it may not still be the total solution, but it could be a really, really good one. One that not only prevents Formula One from suffering, saves Formula One even, but one that potentially puts Formula One in an even greater position than it is today. It could be our blockbuster video and Netflix moment. And that is what I want you guys to think about off the back of what I've just said. What's your moment what changes are you facing? And we're all facing them. Make no mistake about that. We face them every day, let alone on a grander scale, every month or year. Which changes are you facing that you're potentially worried about that could be hiding a potential opportunity in there somewhere? McLaren went through the changing environment of the banning of tobacco products and came out the other side so much stronger than almost every other team because they dealt with it differently. They went out there thinking differently about how they approached clients, how they valued their clients, what level of customer service they could give, something they hadn't had to think about for many years. And as, as a result of many, many, many detailed changes, they landed an enormous deal with Vodafone that lasted for a huge number of years, brought them in a huge amount of money, but also offered more than that. It became a technology partnership. It became a communications partnership. It was way more than simply a sticker in exchange for cash because they saw the change as an opportunity to go out and do things differently. They didn't focus on the threat that was looming over them like many teams at that time did. They embraced the opportunity. And that's what we can all do. If we spend time worrying about a potential threat that's coming our way, worrying about how we can possibly cling on to the way we do things now. How can we hang on to the way of life that we're comfortable with? If we do those things, if we worry about it and we stress about what's coming towards us, we're taking time and capacity. We're taking energy away from focusing on dealing with that change in the right way, focusing on a potential future that offers more opportunity. Our planet and the people that inhabit it have an amazing history of dealing with change, of surviving incredible threats that we've faced over many years. But the real opportunity for anybody facing change in their lives, in the world around them, is not just surviving it. Most of us will survive most changes that are thrust upon us in our lives. But the opportunity comes from not surviving it, but seeing the opportunity that's there, from dealing with it in the right way, from accepting that that change might be coming. There might be nothing we can do about it. It might be beyond our control. But what's totally under our control is what we do about it, is what we do as that change approaches. How do we embrace that change and find the opportunities that might be hidden somewhere beneath the surface? Because that's where success lies. That's where we can come out the other side stronger. We can create a differentiator between us and the competition. Because our natural set of behaviours means that we will try and inherently resist change. People don't like change. They're not comfortable with change. And so that's why we tend to gravitate towards this fight back against change, this resistance to it. But that is clearly where the opportunity lies for those that are willing to go above and beyond, that are willing to go outside of their comfort zone, for those that are willing to embrace the change, put a bit of work in, put a bit of effort in and carve yourself an opportunity where others are seeing threat. So have a think this week about how that could apply to you. Which changes are you facing? We've got global changes, but we all face individual changes too some of which we're not looking forward to. But if they're coming anyway and we can't stop them, 
Is there a way we can flip it on its head? Look at it differently. Try and look around the problem, not stare at it as it's facing you down, as it's imposing this potential threat on you. Can you look around it? Can you look at it in a different way? Can you think about it differently in terms of opportunity? And I believe that if we can do that, we can carve out situations that can make us stronger, that can create more success, more happiness, more fulfillment, whatever it might be. Opportunity lies everywhere around us, but especially when there's change. Okay, that's part one done. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, If you did, please do give me a like, a follow, a rating and a review in the Apple podcast store. It really would mean the world to me. It makes a massive difference to the podcast. I know I say it every week, but I'm saying it because it's true. So please, if you haven't done it yet, just take a moment to go and do that. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And we're going to move on to the next part of Uh, this week's podcast, which actually centres around another question from the same event that I was at at Silverstone, because another part of what we discussed during my talk was some disappointing results for this company. They've just been through a period of time where they were expecting great things, but the results, the financial results, the results of did they or didn't they hit their targets were really disappointing. And there was a slightly low mood in the camp. There was a mood of doom and gloom because they were expecting such great things and yet had actually seen results that didn't match that and were a long way from that. And they were starting to wonder and question themselves as to why that had happened, how on earth they would get things back on track. And one of the questions that came at the end of my talk was somebody who said, have you ever had a really disappointing moment or a crushing defeat that when you look back on it, later led to some kind of amazing win or some amazing success. And I loved that question because Formula One, again, is brilliant at doing this. This is another one of those traits that I have absolutely developed directly from my time in the sport. I'd like to think I was a positive, optimistic person anyway, as one of my general character traits. But what Formula One has done for me is to allow me to apply that trait to generate success, to develop opportunities in business and in life. So applying that F1 mentality, that F1 way of thinking to some of your lowest moments is really where I wanted to go with this part of the podcast. Because the way I answered that question was to say, first of all, of course, there have been lots of those. Almost every single one of the failures in my life, the disappointments in my life, have led on to something bigger and better. That should always be the nature of failure because it's one of the biggest learning experiences we will ever go through. Understanding how not to do something is a giant step towards learning how to do something. That's the nature of when things go wrong. If we embrace that failure, if we take the learnings and the understanding from it, it makes us stronger in the future. And so there are loads of examples, both from within Formula One and in my personal life where that's happened. But the one that I picked out, the one that I gave back to them, I thought I would share with you today, because this is a really powerful message, a really powerful moment, and possibly the lowest point in my Formula One career, the biggest crushing blow, the biggest defeat in my professional Formula One career, which turned into a year later, the biggest single success in my Formula One career, the highlight of my time in Formula One. From a crushing low to an unbelievable high in the space of 12 months. Some of you may have guessed it already, but the high was winning the World Championship with Lewis Hamilton in 2008. Not just through winning the title, the biggest thing you can achieve in this sport, an unbelievably difficult thing to win, but also the way we won it, that 2008 race in Brazil, the highs and lows, the emotional roller coaster of that final race of the season. The way we won it was unbelievable. The support that we had back home from the wider world, not just Formula One fans, being front page news, the the Lewis Hamilton story had become huge and we were part of it. But just 12 months earlier than that, we'd had an unbelievably, crushingly difficult season. 
I don't just mean the way the 2007 season ended, where we didn't win on the final day of the season and Kimi Raikkonen came through and beat both of our drivers who were leading the championship going into that final race. That was bad enough. But that season of 2008 was way worse than that. And it's that moment that I want to describe to you because the answer to the question that this gentleman asked me from the audience just brought all of that emotion back in that moment. 2007 was a season where we should have won everything. We had the two best drivers. We had the best car. We had an amazing team. And again, apologies, I have mentioned some of this before. So apologies if you're hearing it again, but it's absolutely valuable in this context. 2007 should have been the best year of my career, the best year for us as a team. Yet it was the worst absolutely the worst. And you might look at that on some levels and say, well, you know, you finished second and third in the championship. That's not the worst season of your career. Surely there have been other seasons when, you know, you struggle to win a race. 2004, we won just one single race that year. But this wasn't about just results. This wasn't just about how we fared on the racetrack. This was about the way that we operated as a team, the way that we failed in the way we operated as a team. 2007 had the disasters that were the Spygate affair. They had the disasters that were the infighting between our two drivers, Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso, that ended up cascading throughout the organisation, splitting a dividing wall down the middle of our garage, down the middle of our team, pulling our team in half. The second half of that 2007 season was littered with low moments, with disappointments, difficulties, stresses and strains. Moments that nearly broke us, that meant it wasn't enjoyable in any way, shape or form. The environment in which we were working was toxic and destructive. But what I want to talk to you about from 2007 was not just the low moments, was not all that disappointment but more so about how we turned that around. We went from being arguably the weakest team in the pit lane, and I know that's a big claim and it might seem overdramatic, but I'm telling you that from what it felt like on the inside and with the hindsight, looking back, I firmly believe we were in our weakest moment in the second half of 2007. We went from being one of the weakest teams in the pit lane to undoubtedly the strongest team in the pit lane a year later where we won the holy grail of Formula One, that world championship. And I want to tell you about how we did it, because everybody listening to this podcast has faced and will face difficult moments, low moments, disappointing moments in our lives. And when we're in those moments, we're weak, we suffer, we're not operating to the best of our ability, we are clouded quite often by emotion that impairs our judgment, that impairs our ability to make good decisions, to go about the way we live our life in the way that we want to live our life. We struggle in those moments. Every one of us does that and will do that in time. Where I think there is value here in exploring the way that we dealt with that particular situation is to try and offer some evidence, some example that even though we're in those really low moments, in those difficult times in our lives, those are also the moments where, again, some of our biggest opportunities lie. Some of the biggest learnings are happening, even though we might be oblivious to them in that moment, they're there. And one of our biggest skills that we can develop is beginning to recognize those opportunities, those learnings and developments, earlier and earlier in the process so that we're not wallowing in self-pity, dealing with emotions like anger and resentment, worrying about what others might be thinking of us. Because those are all the exact things that we went through in 2007 that cost us time, that cost us results, that cost us success, that meant we ended that season as the weakest team in a Formula One pit lane full of very strong teams. We were weak. We'd been weakened by what happened to us, even though in the longer term, it made us stronger. And the earlier we can start to recognise those elements that make us stronger, the less time we spend being weak. Therefore, we minimise the loss that that period of time creates and we maximise the opportunity 
that the learnings from the failure or the disappointment present to us. At the end of the 2007 season, we were broken. We were broken as a team. We were consumed by all those emotions that I just mentioned. The world was labelling us as cheats over the Spygate affair. We had been publicly vilified as a group, not just the individual that stole the Ferrari information during that Spygate incident, but every single person working for, for McLaren was vilified, were branded cheats by newspapers, on the front pages of newspapers. Every time we flicked on the radio during that period of time, they were talking about it. McLaren were fined $200 million. That's a condemnation of our guilt as a company, as an organisation. I felt guilty even though I hadn't done anything wrong. We felt ashamed of the way that our drivers behaved, of the way that certain members of our own organisation behaved. We were ashamed to talk about who we worked for, who we were in a wider context because of the way McLaren had been portrayed as a company. We were accused by Lewis Hamilton fans of favouring Fernando Alonso. We were accused by Fernando Alonso fans of favouring Lewis Hamilton. And equally, both sets of fans at times accused us of sabotaging the other. Even the drivers got involved in that narrative. We had drivers desperately trying to pull our team apart to gain favour for themselves. It was a horrible, horrible situation. And to be part of that process was so soul-destroying, heartbreaking, emotionally draining, frustrating. So many emotions came to light at the end of that season, a season that we walked away from empty-handed, nothing to show for an incredible amount of hard work perhaps even more hard work than we might have given on any other normal season because we felt this element of guilt where we had to be seen to be working harder than anybody else to overcome the problems that everybody else was talking about, to give ourselves this new reputation that had been destroyed by people in the press, in the media, the drivers, the fans, the people talking about us on a daily basis. We wanted to overcome that reputation that had been now growing over the course of six months by working harder than anybody else. But it resulted in nothing to show for it. And we got to the end of that season and we were broken. And so, of course, like we do at any Formula One season, any Formula One event, we break down what happened. We have to analyse what happened. Why was that such a destructive, disappointing season? It was a difficult process to go through, incredibly difficult at times. We had to ask ourselves some really difficult questions. We had to move some people. We had to move people around. We had to get rid of people. We had to bring in new people. We had to reshape our organisation, reshape our team as a result of the things that we found because what we found was there were failings in almost every area. And whilst that's really difficult to hear, particularly as an elite organisation in this competitive environment, when all you exist to do is to win, to hear that actually we'd failed in almost every area was heartbreaking. But it also provided opportunities for improvement. Because if you're at your lowest point, if you failed miserably, if the bar is now way down low because of the performance you've just given, it also, whilst being disappointing offers opportunity for improvement. There is never a greater opportunity for improvement than when you're at your lowest moment, because the scope to move up, the scope to move forward is greater than ever. If you're winning, finding room for improvement becomes even harder because the margin for improvement is smaller. So when you've had epic failures, epic disappointments, the scope to do better is great. And that's a positive that we had to take from that. We could improve in almost every single area by focusing our efforts on those weaknesses, on those things that we had just learnt that had gone wrong. We changed workflows and structures within the team to make sure that we operated as one coherent team, all pulling in the same direction. It's very obvious, but when you split a team in half, you have two smaller groups of people working on a problem, but not sharing the solutions to those problems, not sharing their working, their developing, not sharing the process, not sharing the understanding they gain. So a small group of people is half the number of minds working on a potential solution to a challenge. 
You've got two groups of those small numbers of people, but they're still small numbers of people that are not communicating well with each other. Working as one team simply doubles the resource you have available to you for that potential solution to be found. And we had to change our structure to encourage that. It seems so obvious, but we slipped into a mentality led by drivers, led by the outside influences of what was going on in the world at the time, led by the media speculation and vilification of our company, of the people within our company. We'd become clouded in our judgment. We'd lost focus of what were actually really obvious things. And by redirecting that focus at the end of 2007, heading into 2008, by bringing ourselves together as one powerful organisation, one team working towards the same goal, making sure that people understood they were all working towards that same goal and we would achieve that goal faster, more efficiently when everyone's working to the same process. And of course, you can still find the opportunities to create advantages for your own driver. In a Formula One team, we have two teams working within a team. That's one of the natures, the inherent natures of our sport. We have to sometimes compete against the people on the other side of the garage. But the competition side of that comes down to the last part of the process. It's the driver out on the racetrack. It's the engineers and the mechanics in the garage at the last moment. Everything up until that point is one team. Everything is focused on how do we overcome the challenge that Ferrari might be presenting us, that somebody else might be throwing our way, that the regulations have presented us in this particular year. How do we become better than our competition? We do it by acting and behaving as one strong, cohesive team. And the bigger picture always has to be that the team comes first. And if you want to behave differently, if you think you're bigger than the team, this is not the right team for you. And of course, it took time to instill those values again, having had them been lost over a period of time. They were all there. They were just buried. They were covered with the mess that had happened over the top of 2007. Communication was another area that we had failed massively on. One of my specific roles in 2008 was to improve communication amongst the team, was to make sure that everybody was working to the same goal, to the same standards, make sure the cars were all being built to the same standards, that all the teams of mechanics inside that Formula One team understood what the biggest mission was here, that we were all trying to do the same thing and move together stronger as one unit. Communication was central to that. The way that we communicated between management and the shop floor, if you want to call it that, absolutely crucial. Ron Dennis was instrumental in changing the way that we focused on the disappointment of the Spygate affair. That had been a massively damaging period of time for our team, not just in the obvious ways of being thrown out of the Constructors' Championship in 2007, a championship we hands down would and should have won by miles that year. Not just because we had the obvious disadvantage of being fined $200 million. Huge blows to an organisation. But even more powerful was the effect on every one of the individuals, me included, of how the world perceived McLaren, how we felt like the world perceived us. Being branded as cheats in the outside world had probably the biggest blow of all. I wasn't a cheat. My colleagues around me, they weren't cheats. We had always operated to the best of our ability, to the values and beliefs that were true to us. We'd always done things or tried to do things the right way. We'd worked hard for any success that had come our way in the past. And yet all of that felt like it was nothing. It felt like it had disappeared. It was meaningless because people thought of us as cheats because of the actions of one person at the top of our organisation that brought in the Ferrari information and caused us all manner of problems as a result. But the way Ron turned that around for us was to suggest that we go into 2008. Yes, we're full of anger. Yes, we're full of resentment. We're resentful to the people at the top of our team that caused these troubles, the person that brought the information in. Huge amount of anger towards that person. But they were gone. There was a massive amount of anger to the FIA, to the media on occasions, because of the way they had treated us 
during that whole affair. And what Ron said was, use that anger, use that frustration, use that resentment and rechannel it. Take it away from those people. If you use your anger and focus your anger on those outside resources, you're not going to affect those. You're not going to change those. It's not going to do you any good. So use that anger and frustration and let's channel it into being the best team that we can be in 2008. And we took on this mentality that the world hated us. We took on this viewpoint that if they're going to hate us, if they're going to write these things about us, if they're going to say these things and call us cheats and all manner of other names, if they're going to boo us when we come to a racetrack, we're going to use that to our advantage. And we will pull down the garage doors, we'll close ranks, and it'll be us versus the world. And that mentality brought our team together in a way that was way more powerful than anything we could have done without having that huge disappointment and failure happen to us the year before. It was a powerful way of looking at the problem. It was us versus the world. And if that's the case, we can't rely on anybody outside of the walls of our factory or of our garage. It's everybody wearing that McLaren uniform for us. We're all pulling together. We're going to take on the world and we're going to win. And you know what? We did. We went to 2008 and we went through that season. We made sure that we corrected most of the mistakes that we'd made the year before in terms of fighting one half of our garage against the other to the detriment of the team where we had lost those silly races like in 2007 where Lewis Hamilton ended up in the gravel trap in the pit lane because they refused to pit that car earlier because so much focus was being put on our teammate, on Fernando Alonso. We wanted to cover him more than we wanted to win the championship, to do the right thing for the longer game, and it cost us. Those kind of examples we could not let happen again. It was us versus the world. So we would drag each other all the way through this championship. We would fight tooth and nail to fight off any competition and we'd do it together. The power that that gave our organisation as one team, whereas just 12 months earlier, we'd been split into two smaller teams, two smaller, angry, disjointed teams, was immense. The communication that came from Ron and from the management and others around the organisation was revamped, totally revamped. There was a pride reinstilled at McLaren. I felt an enormous sense of pride that I'd lost the year before. And importantly, there was a belief that returned to McLaren, a belief that we were going to win this championship. Nobody was going to stop us. We were going to fight tooth and nail to take what we believed was rightly ours, having lost out on it the year before, through a number of things that weren't necessarily our fault. They weren't our fault, but they were our responsibility to fix and get right this time. And that's exactly what we did. And the reason that I'm telling you that story was because it was such a powerful one for me. It's the way I answered that question at the event at Silverstone that I was referring to earlier. But it's also something that I think we can all apply to our lives. We all have huge disappointments. We have failures all of the time. Every single one of us is not a person on this planet that doesn't suffer failure regularly. The most successful people on this planet suffer more failure than most because they put themselves into situations where they might fail. They go outside of their comfort zone in the same way that I talked in the first part of this podcast, doing things differently, taking risks, thinking outside the box, putting yourself into uncomfortable situations provides opportunity. It won't always work out for you. There will be failures that come from putting yourselves in those kind of situations. But from the biggest failures come the biggest learnings. And if you embrace the biggest learnings in your life, if you look back at moments in your life that have happened that have been really disappointing, that have been real low moments, there is always something to take from it that can help you moving forward. And that's got to be the biggest point of this part of the podcast. The biggest message I hope that will come out of this is that huge failure leads on to huge success if we deal with it in the right way. How many people listening to this have lost a job that they might have loved at the time? 
and felt so low about it. Being made redundant can feel like the worst blow in the world. It can feel like you're at rock bottom. What on earth are you going to do in the future? But if you look back at those moments, how many of those people have gone on to do other jobs that they maybe now love? That might have happened because the situation that you were forced into through that disappointment has created opportunity because you were through necessity then having to go out and look for new jobs. You were putting yourself out there. You were thinking about different careers, maybe a different career change. You might have put yourself into situations you would have never put yourself in when you were in that comfortable place of having the job, going there every day, doing the same things over and over again. There's nothing wrong with that. But when the disappointment comes, it may be beyond your control. When it comes, the sooner we can see the opportunity rather than remaining down and doomy and gloomy, that's when the opportunity comes more quickly. How many people have ended relationships or been dumped by a partner? Something that can be incredibly difficult to go through emotionally. But I wonder how many of those people have gone on to have better relationships, more successful relationships, happier relationships in the future. Because again, their situation changed. And by embracing that situation, it may have taken time. But in the end, when you embrace that situation... Did you start to think about things differently, put yourself in a different mindset, which would have portrayed you differently to the outside world, which may have meant you went into situations you would never have normally gone into. And maybe that is where you met somebody that you fell head over heels in love with, had the most beautiful relationship that maybe still continues to this day. How long did you spend down in the dumps, wallowing in self-pity when that first relationship ended? I know that I've been through situations when I've been trying to move house in the past where you have your heart set on buying a certain house and you get so far down the process and then it falls apart. That can feel like a massive blow because you were planning your future already in that house. You'd grown to love it even before you'd signed on the dotted line. But then you end up moving on in the process. You learn from the things that didn't work out last time and you apply them to the next search. You apply them to the next part of that process. And maybe you end up with a house that's better than the one you originally were looking at. I know that that has happened to me on more than one occasion. It's the same with jobs. It's the same with relationships. It's the same with so many things in our lives. If we're able to find the learnings from the problem we've just been through, the failure that we've just experienced, the thing that's happened to us that may have been way beyond our control, that feels like the end of the world. It never is the end of the world. There's always some kind of opportunity in there somewhere. If we can understand what went wrong, what we could have done better, Although we can't go back and change that particular incident, what we can do is have complete control over what we do next. And that is where the opportunity lies. Taking control of your situation, not being out of control, not being swept along by emotion for longer than is necessary. By taking control, by wrestling back that control, taking the learnings from what happened last time and applying them to your future endeavours, behaviours, decisions that you make. If you can apply those learnings over and over again, you become stronger over and over again because the failures will continue to happen. The disappointments are inevitable. They will happen over again in your life. There may be nothing you can do about many of those situations. But what you can do something about is how you deal with them. And that, I hope, is the biggest lesson to come out of all of this. Things happen to us in life that are way beyond our control. Some of those can feel threatening. Some feel disappointing. Some can feel like there's no way we can go on past it. But we always can. And if the stories that I've told from my time in Formula One today, how Formula One is dealing with threats and has dealt with threats in the past, how my team dealt with one of the most disappointing situations that I ever faced in Formula One and yet came out the other side as the most powerful, strongest team in the sport and went on to win the biggest prize on offer. If any of those things can resonate with you, can make you think about your own life in that way, Looking for opportunity where others see a threat, looking for the learnings that might come from a disappointing moment in your life. Those are the things that will make you stronger, more powerful, more successful. And I hope in the end, happier, more fulfilled, more resilient with every one of those steps you go through. 
It's a continual process. You don't fail once and then you succeed forevermore. You will continue to fail. You should embrace failing because that is where those learnings lie. Think about that this week. I hope you have a wonderful seven days and I'll be back next Monday with another episode. In the meantime, remember this, everybody. Do the right things and do the things right.